Okay, we're back, and today we're talking about poetry. We're moving on to the third unit, which is poetry. Now, a lot of students say, oh, I don't like poetry, or it's boring, or it's too hard, it's too difficult to understand. So I started with Robert Frost because I think he's very accessible, meaning it's not very difficult to understand, at least at some level, what he's trying to say to us, what his themes are, or what his message is. And if you say, I don't like poetry, I would say, okay, but do you like playing a favorite song of yours and singing along? Probably what you like about singing along is the way that the words are conveyed, not just what the words are and not just the ideas that the words convey, but how the words are conveyed, how they sound when you sing along to them, okay? And that's part of the beauty of poetry is the sound of language, uh, the sound of the meter and the sound if there are uh, rhymes, that sort of thing. I think, though, why a lot, of, a lot of students get turned off to poetry is the way it's taught in high school, where a teacher will read the poem and say, well, what do you think it means? And then maybe you raise your hand and give an idea, and then, you know, somebody else raises a hand and gives an idea. And eventually, it seems like the teacher is going to reveal the secret, as if a poem is some sort of a, a riddle that needs to be solved. Um, I think that's the wrong way to think about poetry. Poetries have themes, they have messages, and they're conveyed in poetic ways. I think there's also an emphasis on the elements of poetry. If this were a poetry class, if we were to have 17 weeks together just to talk about poetry, I would talk about things like meter, iambic pentameter, uh, trochaic trimeter. I would talk about these things. Uh, I would talk about rhyme. I would talk about metaphor. I would talk about rhythm. I would talk about uh, how poems are broken into stanzas. We would get really deeply into this. And it would be valuable if we had time to think about these sorts of things, simile, metaphor. And we'll mention these things in passing. But the difficult part is moving from, okay, here is a poetic fact of the poem. Uh, here's the rhyme scheme of the poem. Uh, here's its iambic uh, trimeter. What does that mean? Going from the elements of poetry to how some sort of meaning is conveyed in the poem, that to me is always a great leap. In the same way, if I were to say, all right, write a paper and explain how the music being played uh, helps you better understand the lyrics. I'm not saying it can't be done, but all you really want to do is just listen to the song and sing along and have joy from singing along with the song. Now, while I think it is a mistake to think of a poem as a type of riddle for which there is a single solution, however you're going to interpret, say, a theme or a message of the poem has to be determined by what's in the poem itself. Okay, so if we're reading a poem and say, well, this poem reminds me of my grandfather, and then the whole meaning of the poem is somehow about your grandfather. Well, your poet probably didn't know your grandfather, and so we have to go with what's actually in the poem itself. So as I go through poetry in this unit, I'm going to read it, and I'm going to tell you how it works for me, and what I think is a subordable interpretation of a theme or some sort of message. And again, a theme is just a, an idea, a concept, or even a message that, in this case, a poet is trying to convey. And so I want to read with you and see, okay, what are supportable, defendable themes or messages that we can derive from these poems. I start with The Road Not Taken because what's really interesting to me is this is one of the most taught poems, especially in junior high school or high schools. If you haven't come across it yet, I guess it's about time you, you did. I think it is one of the most misread poems. And I say that simply because to read it in a particular way, you have to kind of ignore the two middle stanzas. Let's look at it together. The Road Not Taken. Two roads diverge in a yellow wood, and sorry, I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other, as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though, as for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, in leaves no step had trod in black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet, knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverge in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference.
Okay, so let's examine this one closely. Uh, when I was taught this one, I don't remember, junior high, high school, maybe both, it was presented to me as rugged individualism. It is about the narrator celebrating, taking the road less traveled by, doesn't follow the herd. He's his own person. So when he comes across a choice like two roads, a decision in his life, uh, he's not going to just follow the herd and do what everybody else does. And that, he assures us, has made all the difference. But if we look more closely at the poem, is that reading really supported? The road not taken, the, the title itself has come to mean something in your life where you had a choice and you chose A, but you're wondering what would have happened if you followed B instead. It could be anything in our lives. Maybe as somebody says to you, oh, whatever happened to your old boyfriend or girlfriend? You know, I thought you guys were great together. Whatever happened to that person? You might say, oh, the road not taken. And that's a way of saying, I don't know what would have happened had we stayed together. Or, oh, why'd you go to this school versus that school? You might say, well, the road not taken. Okay. In other words, I don't know where that other road leads okay so we start with i think what's clearly a metaphor right about having to make a decision a traveler is there there's two roads and he has to choose one and he realizes i cannot travel both and be one traveler he can't split himself in two so he has to make some sort of decision okay so let's say it's it's you you've applied to some four-year colleges and you get two of them and both of them are colleges you really want to go to, but you got to choose one. You can't go to both, right? And they're both really good, and you're trying to decide how to make the decision, okay? And so this traveler does what you would do. Look down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. In other words, try to do dil due diligence, right? Try to say, all right, well, w what are the pluses and minuses, okay? At least he's looking at one of these roads really carefully. Then took the other as just as fair. So he decides, I'm going to take the other because it's just as good, as just as fair. Then says, and having perhaps the better claim, maybe it's even better, because it was grassy and wanted wear. In other words, fewer people had walked on that road. So maybe it had the better claim. It maybe it was a better choice because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. So he says, I took the other one because it was probably better because it was grassy and wanted wear. Not many people had walked on that road before. But then he says, but they're really both the same. Okay, so if he is saying that I chose one because it was uh, grassy and wanted wear, but the other one was also grassy and wanted wear, he can't really use that as a reason for making the choice. Okay. Now, if it's a major choice, like what university to go to, what four-year school to go to, and you just can't decide, and if somebody says to you, well, why don't you just flip a coin? I think a lot of us would say, oh, I can't do that. It's too big of a decision. I can't, it can't be a coin flip. But maybe in the end, maybe it was a mental coin flip. Maybe it was a, a mental eeny, meeny, miny, mo. It's if, uh, in the end, you have to make some sort of choice, right? And in the end, maybe that's just what it is. So the idea that one road was less traveled by than the other is false. And he knows it's false, even as he's staring at the two roads. Okay, let's keep going. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trod in black. So to reemphasize the point, nobody else had walked on either one of those roads on that particular day or maybe in the recent past because there's no footsteps on those roads at all. So he said, oh, I kept the first for another day. In other words, all right, I'll take this road today and I'll take that road another day. And then once again, he realizes, well, I'm kind of fooling myself because yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. Okay, so this sort of recognition, I'm not going to find myself at this crossroads again, because if I take road A, it's going to lead to another road, to another road, to another road, to another road, to a series of events that's never going to bring me back to this point. Okay, so to sort of recap, he has two roads to choose from. They're pretty much the same. And he says, well, I'll take the other one another time. But come on, let's be honest. I'm not going to find myself at this crossroads again. I, I really doubt that that's going to happen. Till we got, get to the final stanza. I will be telling this with a sigh. 
interesting. We don't know what kind of sigh that is. You know, it could be a good sigh, a happy sigh. It could be sort of a sad, regretful sigh. But I'll tell you what, I have never in my life planned ahead a sigh. Sighs are supposed to kind of come out of you spontaneously, aren't they? So he's already saying, somewhere ages and ages hence, I will be telling this with a sigh. He's already planning on exactly how he's going to sell it. Okay, he's going to start with a sigh. Then he's going to say, two roads diverged in a wood and I, then he's going to pause. And then he's going to say, I again, I pause. I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. I took the one less traveled by. Well, first of all, one wasn't less traveled by than the other, right? They were equally, you know, less traveled. They were equally little tra traveled, okay? And then finally, and that has made all the difference. Well, we can't know what that difference is. Now, if you said, well, I decided on this particular university, I'm so glad I did. I made lifelong friends. I had a great experience there. Uh, it led to this great career I'm having. I'm very happy with my life. I'm so, so glad I went to college A. But you don't know what would have happened had you gone to college B, right? Maybe you would have made better friends. Maybe you would have ended up even in a happier circumstance. You just don't know. So when he says that has made all the difference, if I said to you, what's the difference between uh, five and three, you would say two, right? The difference between five and three is two. But if I said, okay, what's the difference between five? And you'd say five and what? Well, if I don't tell you what the other number is, you can't say what the difference is, right? So what's the difference between college A and college B? I don't know. So therefore, I can't say it has made all the difference. So if this poem is not about rugged individualism and being your own person and making your choices and also not following the herd, what is it really about? Well, again, this is just my take on it, okay? My take, first of all, is that the way I was taught it in high school doesn't seem supportable, that I chose the road less traveled by. That only works if there was one less traveled by. Okay, but my take is this poem is more about how in retrospective, when we are looking back and thinking about the decisions we've made in our lives, how they've led us to the present. And oftentimes there almost seems to be sort of a intentionality as if life is a chess game and we're always trying to make, we're always thinking through the, the, the best move. We don't like to think that some of the biggest decisions in our lives are really coin tosses, aren't they? And so to me, this poem is more about how he is projecting into the future, how at some future date, he will explain to whoever asks why he chose road A over road B. And he will say very dramatically with a sigh and pausing between each eye. And then he's going to fib because he wants to convince himself or other people or both that the choices he made were the right choices, even though there's no way of knowing where that other road led. So to go back to the title, The Road Not Taken, we know nothing about that road, do we? We can only imagine what that road would have been like, where it would have led us. So we can't say it has made all the difference. So to me, this is a poem about the human urge to provide intention and purpose to what can sometimes be the random choices we make in life. Let's take a look at another famous poem of his called Fire and Ice, very short. Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. Okay, so this poem was written in 1923, and so the nuclear age didn't start until uh, 1945, right? So Frost isn't talking when he says the world will end in fire. I don't think he's talking about some sort of a nuclear holocaust, okay? But in 1923, a war had just ended, a world war had just ended five years ago. So when he's thinking in terms of fire, he's probably, in my mind, thinking in terms of uh, violence, right? Uh, shooting, killing each other, destroying each other actively through the destructive power of fire. So that's one way the world might end. But other people say, no, the world is going to end in ice. And what would that mean? I can picture the world ending in fire. We destroy ourselves through violence and, and the chaos that we, we, we visit upon each other. But what would it mean to die of ice? Well, maybe ice is the feeling of hatred that makes us withdraw and stay away from each other. 
and not interact with each other. Uh, and so the world just sort of eventually just sort of dies off in this chill, this uncaring, unloving chill. Okay, so maybe that's sort of the alternatives, okay? We'll either destroy ourselves actively by burning the world or we'll freeze by not loving one another, okay? Again, this is my take on it. Your take might be different, but I think it's a supportable uh, take. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. Okay, those who favor fire don't mean they're hoping for fire, mean they think it's more likely the world will end in fire. Okay, but I find really interesting because when I think of war and violence, I think of hatred. But he says, no, it's more in terms of desire. What really starts a war? Is it I hate those people over there and I'm going to invade that country? Or is it they have what I want and I'm going to go take it? I'll come up with an excuse for why I'm taking it. But those people over there have what I want what my tribe wants. So my tribe is going to go and attack that tribe, not because we hate the tribe as much as because we desire what the tribe has. But then he says, so he agrees that that is the most likely way the world will end. But he said, if it had to perish twice. So I suppose if it didn't completely end the first time and there were some of us who survived that fire of destruction, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice, would be enough. As he says, the world might end with hate, isolation, coldness, ab absence of love. So it's an interesting debate he poses. In some ways, you know, I guess from a, when I studied astronomy, I learned that um, the someday, not soon, but someday the sun is going to blow up. So I guess. Physically, the world, if we mean the Earth, will end in fire, okay? Uh, or, I don't know, maybe in 1923 they thought it was possible the sun could just wink out, right, and end in ice. And so I think he's doing, again, this sort of metaphor, fire and ice. These metaphors I don't think really are literally fire and ice. I think they are metaphor for hostile, warlike, firing upon each other, destruction through fire. Uh, the world had just come through a very, very destructive war, uh, World War I, and so uh, Robert Frost knew what he was speaking of. And then ice, of course, is if we just stop loving each other and just hate each other and let the world just sort of peter out in that way, not with a bang, but with a whimper. Okay, and finally, a third poem of his, Out, Out. And that title, as it says in the footnote below, is a speech uh, by Macbeth upon hearing that his wife had died. What he says is, out, out, brief candle, life is but a walking shadow. And he contemplates of how fragile life is and maybe ultimately how meaningless it is. Okay, so it's interesting that Robert Frost would choose that title for this poem. Obviously worth sort of thinking about investigating. The buzz saw snarled and rattled in the yard and made dust and dropped stove lane sticks of wood, sweet sw scented stuff when the breeze drew across it. And from there, those that lifted eyes could count five mountain ranges, one behind the other, under the sunset far into, far into Vermont. And the sn saw snarled and rattled, snarled and rattled as it ran light or had to bear a load and nothing happened, uh, day was all but done. Call it a day, I wish they might have said, to please the boy by giving him the half hour that a boy counts so much when saved from work. His sister stood beside them in her apron to tell them supper. At the word, the saw, as if to prove saws knew what supper meant, leapt out of the boy's hand, or seemed to leap. He must have given the hand. However it was, neither refused the meeting, but the hand. The boy's first outcry was a rueful laugh as he swung towards them holding up the hand, half in appeal, but half as if to keep the life from spilling. Then the boy saw all, since he was old enough to know, big boy doing a man's work, though a child at heart. He saw all spoiled. Don't let them cut my hand off. The doctor, when he comes, don't let him, sister. So, but the hand was gone already. The doctor put him in the dark of ether. He lay and puffed his lips out with his breath. And then 
The watcher at his pulse took fright. No one believed. They listened at his heart. Little, less, nothing. And that ended it. No more to build on there. And they, since they were not the one dead, turned to their affairs. So Robert Frost, he was actually born in California, but he spent a lot of time in New England and Vermont in particular, especially in the rural sort of farming uh, or blue collar, uh, in this case, logging sort of areas. Okay, And he visited amongst sort of the common people and he was fascinated by them, the, the, the working class and the, the, the lives they live. And so several of his poems are about farming or raising animals, raising livestock, or in this case, I guess a sawmill, okay? It seems like a kind of a small sawmill outfit if they have a, a boy, you know, working there, uh, pushing wood through the saw. And so we have here uh, just the, snar the, the saw is snarling and rattling. It's just sort of violent. It's almost as if the, sn uh, the, the saw is an animal, like a vicious sort of snarling and rattling animal. We have there some what's called onomatopoeia, which is where the at least rattled. Rattle's a good onomatopoetic word. It sounds like uh, what it is, okay? Something rattles. It kind of sounds like that. The word crash, we think, uh, sounds like um, when you drop a dish on the floor. That's what onomatopoeia is. Okay, nothing happened. It was just a normal day. It was just about over. Call it a day, I wish they might have said, because it wasn't quite over. It was maybe a half hour left to go, and just let this boy have his extra half hour that a boy counts so much when saved from work. Okay, so if he's a young man, a boy working all day long, my God, just give him an, a half hour to just sort of relax, kind of kick back, think about the day's work. And then his sister said, supper. And maybe that surprised him or shocked him, or maybe he was saying, oh, good, supper. But it was a moment of distraction. Because at the word, the saw, as if to prove saws knew what supper meant, which of course is ridiculous, leapt out of the boy's hand or seemed to leap. He must have given the hand. So the narrator is almost kind of confused by what he saw what he witnessed it almost had looked as if the saw jumped up and tried to take off the boy's hand but then he realizes it was probably a fixed saw so it's probably the boy just at that moment just at that moment of distraction stuck his uh hand stuck his wrist into the saw that's why he says he must have given the hand however it was neither refused the meeting okay so the saw didn't say i don't want that hand and the hand didn't say i don't want that saw but the hand, forget the soft, the hand, the boy's first outcry was a rueful laugh. So the pain uh, and the shock of it hasn't quite hit him yet. Okay. And so his first reaction is sort of a rueful laugh. Like, can you believe it? So that's sort of the first sort of reaction. It's like, it hasn't quite hit him yet. And I don't know if you've had the experience where uh, you're stumbling along and maybe you hit your knee against something and it takes like a few seconds before the pain actually hits you or you stub your toe, it takes a few seconds. And so his first reaction is sort of this pff, rueful laugh, almost like, can you believe it? Okay, so sort of regretful sort of laugh, okay. As he swung towards them, holding up the hand. So the hand is off of, it, the hand is detached from his arm. Half in appeal, but also have to keep the life from spilling. And then he saw it all, right? He now recognized that, you know, in, in 19... Uh, in 16, when this poem was written, for a young man like that to lose his hand, so much of what probably he was hoping and dreaming of in his life, it's lost almost instantly, okay? Then the boy saw all, since he was old enough to know, big boy doing a man's work, though a child at heart. So he knew that all, you know, so much of what he was hoping and dreaming for, perhaps, is gone. He saw all spoiled. Okay. Now, not at this moment, nobody's thinking, well, this is absolutely necessarily fatal. Okay. It certainly could be, but it's not necessarily fatal. So he saw all spoiled probably were all of his hopes and dreams. And maybe he was just going to go throw a baseball around for his free half hour if he had one. And now that of course is all spoiled. And so in his sort of panic, he says something ridiculous. Don't let him cut my hand off the doctor, when he comes, well, the hand is already cut off. There's nothing that can be done. And of course, back in 1916, they couldn't sew the hand back on. 
right? So that hand is lost. And then this weird sort of very, very brief sentence. It's not even a sentence. It's just a single word, a small word. So don't let them cut my hand off. Don't let them sister, exclamation point. Then so. And to me, that so is, well, that's that. Or the 1916 version of it is what it is. What can you do? Nothing. But the hand was gone already. So the doctor put him in the dark of ether. Ether is what they would use to knock you out. It's a knockout drug at that time. And he lay, puffed his lips out with his breath. And then the watcher at his pulse took fright. So it could be fatal. Certainly the body um, from such trauma can go into shock. And shock can lead to death, like a heart stoppage, for example. And so the watcher at the pulse is realizing, oh, his pulse, he's, I'm, I'm losing his pulse. No one believed. I guess nobody wants to believe that it can just happen like that. Just instantly, somebody says supper, the, the, the saw leaves, the hand is cut off. And not long after, uh, maybe hours later, he's, he's losing the fight. He's dying. No one believed. So if the, if the watcher at his pulse says, I'm losing his pulse, people are looking at each other. That can't be it. That can't be right. They listened at his heart. So people are putting their head down to his chest, perhaps the doctor, perhaps family, little less nothing, and that ended it. And so the realization, there's nowhere to go from here. There's, there's nothing left to do. No more to build on there. And then the most remarkable part of this poem to me, the most poignant, and they, since they were not the one dead, turned to their affairs. Those who are not dead have nothing to do but to go on with life. Now, what are their affairs? Well, if it's a family, they'll have to arrange to have him buried, perhaps a funeral. Uh, other people are, well, I, I got to get home, you know, to my family. This is what we do. And in some ways, it seems like a betrayal to this young man that just in this, in the matter of a few hours, this healthy young boy really was fine and perhaps was looking forward to just a half hour of doing his own thing. And a couple of hours later, maybe not even that, just long enough for the doctor to arrive and put the boy under, under ether, and now he's slipping away. And so it almost seems like a betrayal of the dead. There's a poem uh, that Robert Frost wrote called Home Burial, and it's about this uh, husband and uh, wife who lost an infant child. And she's devastated by it, and so is he. But he did what they would do at that time in the country. He went out to the backyard and he dug a hole and he buried his little child. And the wife, who from an upper window watched him do the digging, couldn't understand. She said to herself, who is this man who can do this thing? Of course, he has no choice. This is what needs to be done. But she just said, I can't be with you anymore because I don't know you anymore. And he said, well, I loved him too. And she said, we say we love people, but then we don't follow them to the grave, do we? We go that far, we walk right up to the grave with them, and then we go no further. And so in exasperation, he doesn't, the husband doesn't know what to do. I think Frost is doing something similar here. The ones we love and lose, we can only go so far. We could walk up to the edge of the grave, but that's as far as we can go. At which point, because we are not the one dead, we have to turn to our affairs. We have to get on with our lives. Okay, so for next time, we'll be looking at some more poetry. Uh, take care. See you then. Bye.